Welcome back to the Hard Round Box News Corner, I believe. Wow, it's been about a month since we did one of these news roundups. Been quite busy with all the latest hardware to be benchmarked, releases, and all of that, but there's always news happening in the tech space, so let's get into the topics. First though, I did want to mention that we won't be covering any of the RTX 3080 crashing issues in this news video because Steve did a full investigation on that yesterday. It's obviously been quite a hot topic since the launch of the new GPUs with the whole capacitor and driver situation, but Steve's breakdown pretty much covers our thoughts and the facts on the situation. Well worth a view if you haven't already, I'll put some links in the description. The first story in today's video is hot off the presses, in fact so hot that I had to go back and update this video after I'd finished it to add in this section. Anyway, as you're seeing on screen now, Nvidia has officially delayed the GeForce RTX 3070 to October 29th. Originally, the card was set to come out on October 15th, so Nvidia is simply pushing back the date by two weeks. The reasoning Nvidia gives is that they've heard from many of you that there should be more cards available on launch day. This shift will, in Nvidia's words, help our global partners get more graphics cards into the hands of gamers on launch day. I guess there's really two ways to look at this. It's great that Nvidia are listening to consumer feedback and are taking steps to avoid the launch day mess we saw with the RTX 3080 and RTX 3090 launches. Hopefully the two week delay will lead to more stock available on day one, although I'd still place bets on stock selling out within seconds or minutes. On the other hand, as Nvidia alludes to in their post, it may be disappointing to those that wanted to buy an RTX 3070 as soon as possible. This information is so fresh that I'm really not sure what will happen with reviews. I'd still expect to see performance numbers from us around the launch, either on the 29th or perhaps a day or two beforehand, like we got with the RTX 3080. You can see Nvidia's benchmarks for the GPU here, with Nvidia claiming the card is around the mark of a 2080 Ti and 60% faster than an RTX 2070 on average. This date shift also puts the RTX 3070 release right next to AMD's launch event for next generation RDNA 2 GPUs. AMD is set to unveil Big Navi on October 28th, so we'll be getting that announcement right before you can buy an RTX 3070. That could go either way, maybe AMD will show you something to make you think twice about a purchase, or maybe you won't be impressed and buy an RTX 3070 anyway. But it will be interesting to have at least some RDNA2 information before you can buy the RTX 3070, which wasn't originally the case. With that said, we don't expect to have any RDNA2 cards in hand before AMD's event, so don't expect reviews to go live then. Anyway, that's the fresh off the press news for today. Uh, on with the rest of the topics. The major topic that I wanted to look at today is everything that's been happening in the lead up to the announcement of AMD's Zen 3 processors. As we know, AMD has scheduled a launch event to unveil their Zen 3 CPUs on October 8th. And in the space of just a few weeks, we've gone from hearing virtually nothing on these processors to seeing a whole range of developments, including rumors and new official announcements from partners. So to stress, in this section, some of what we'll be talking about is unconfirmed, so take it with a grain of salt, but I do think it's worth covering at least some of the leaks and sharing our thoughts on what is going on. Firstly, let's talk about the launch timeline. We're all going to learn about Zen 3 at the same time on October 8th, so as far as I'm aware, and this information may change between now and next week, there is no pre-briefing for media and we certainly don't have samples at hand yet or anything like that. So what this means is it's very unlikely that AMD will be announcing Zen 3 CPUs and then suddenly releasing them onto the market within the following few days. There is going to be a bit of a buffer here. The latest rumors from sources like Computerbase and a few others suggest that AMD has scheduled launch releases for October 20th and 27th. If that's true, and we have no idea whether it is, that would be a pretty standard launch cadence for a CPU release. Launch one week, release it a few weeks later. We also don't know what CPUs are coming on those dates, although it's very likely AMD will look to stagger the launches across multiple weeks to avoid any major issues. So probably something like Ryzen 7 first, maybe Ryzen 9 the following week, and then we'll have to wait a little bit for Ryzen 5. It also seems likely at this point that AMD will be branding their Zen 3 processors as Ryzen 5000. The thinking here is to align the mobile and desktop lineups with the same naming for the same architecture. The current mess we have now sees Ryzen 3000 on desktop as Zen 2, but on mobile it's Zen Plus, 
with mobile Zen 2 parts and desktop Zen 2 APUs getting the Ryzen 4000 name. So as you can see, that's pretty confusing. So we're expecting to see the 5000 series have Zen 3 across the board for both desktop and mobile with no major differences to individual SKU names. So, you know, Ryzen 7 5800X, Ryzen 5 5600X and so on. There's also been a few performance leaks lately from benchmarks like Ashes of the Singularity and CPU Z that suggest these new Zen 3 CPUs will be pretty fast. Everyone wants to know whether Zen 3 will beat Intel for single-threaded workloads and gaming. These benchmarks seem to suggest that. But what I really want to stress here is not to read too much into early benchmark numbers from just a single benchmark or game. If you go back and look at most early benchmarks that come out for new CPU generations, the numbers usually don't give a full or accurate picture of what's going on. It can overestimate performance, it can underestimate performance, but blindly believing leaks is a recipe for trouble. It's also not totally clear what we'll be getting from Zen 3 processors this generation as AMD really hasn't disclosed much about the architecture at this point. We're expecting to see a more unified cache design that resolves some of the CCX split issues as well as higher clock speeds. However, we aren't expecting any fundamental changes to the core offerings, so a lineup that includes 6, 8, 12 and 16 cores again seems likely. In more factual information, we've seen two OEMs get prepared for the launch of Zen 3 later this month. MSI has released new beta BIOSes for 11 of their 500 series motherboards, 5 in their X570 range and 6 in B550. This beta BIOS includes support for future AM4 socket processors, which of course means Zen 3, but to avoid any issues with AMD, they aren't specifically naming that. In fact, they say to refer to AMD's official announcement for future AM4 processors. The boards getting these beta BIOSes today are many of the most popular models, such as the X570 Tomahawk, X570 Unify, B550 Tomahawk, B550 Mortar, and so on. The rest of MSI's 500 series lineup will get beta support in the middle of October, while A520 will see support at the end of October. Then we can expect a final production release of the BIOS from the end of October, according to MSI's release timeline. This timeline doesn't include any word on B450 motherboards, which we also expect to get Zen 3 support at some point, particularly the Mac series. But the launch priority will be for 500 series, and it's good to see some BIOS updates being prepared now, so people have time to get their systems sorted before rushing out to buy a new CPU. I'd expect more motherboard vendors to get on board with this before launch. The other OEM getting prepared for Zen 3 is ASUS. This week, the company announced a refreshed B450 lineup, and while the company didn't explicitly say that they are designed for upcoming processors, there's a few hints in the feature list. Every refreshed B450 board from ASUS now has a BIOS flashback feature for firmware upgrades without a CPU, and high-capacity firmware chips are being used as well. Both of these features will be Awfully handy for those wanting to buy a new ASUS B450 board and update it with a BIOS for Zen 3. The new models will have a 2 in Roman numerals after the product name, some examples being the ROG Strix B450F Gaming 2 and Tough Gaming B450 Plus 2. That's something to look out for if you're interested in buying a new B450 motherboard, although of course we don't have any confirmation on what ASUS's support for upcoming processors will look like with their non-500 series lines. That's pretty much it on the Zen 3 stuff for now. We'll be giving our thoughts on the announcement next week, and hopefully it's jam-packed with architecture info and all the SKUs. Pretty busy month coming up this month, actually. We have the announcement and likely release of Zen 3, the RTX 3070, and later the announcement of new RDNA 2 GPUs as well. In addition to Zen 3 rumors, this week has also been dominated with discussion around other NVIDIA GPUs that are coming down the track. We've already talked a bit on the channel about the potential 20 gigabyte variant of the RTX 3080 and 16 gigabyte variant of the RTX 3070, but this week saw more information come to light about a supposed RTX 3060 Ti. The main news is that several gigabyte RTX 3060 Ti models were seen passing through the Eurasian Economic Commission, which has been a great source of GPU leaks over the last few years. The models are listed under the Aorus Master, Gaming OC, Eagle OC, and Eagle brands, and all are shown to have 8 gigabytes of memory. Launching an RTX 3060 Ti before an RTX 3060 is an interesting move from Nvidia and points to them wanting to slowly work their way down the product stack with clear product differentiation, rather than launching, you know, 
an RTX 3060 Now, then an RTX 3060 Ti, and then probably an RTX 3060 Super or something dumb later on. The 3060 Ti would of course slot below the 3070 and would indicate that a standard 3060 is on its way. As for specifications, video cards are reporting the 3060 will pack 4864 CUDA cores and the same GA104 die as the RTX 3070. So if the 3070 is giving us 2080 Ti like performance, the 3060 Ti with that CUDA count would be somewhere around the mark of a 2080, although of course at a lower price given the 3070 is already priced at $500. This is all just speculation of course, so take it with a grain of salt, we don't have any information on pricing this far out from launch, in fact we don't even have a release date, although video cards believe it will come directly after the 3070. Speaking of the 3070, earlier today images appeared of an RTX 3070 GPU die that's destined for mobile applications. The image was posted to the NGA forums but appears to be legitimate, showing a qualification sample of a GA104 die surrounded by GDDR6 memory. This suggests that, as you might expect, NVIDIA is also working on a mobile RTX 30 series using similar chips to the desktop parts, like what we've seen with previous GeForce laptop SKUs. On the desktop, NVIDIA are claiming the RTX 3070 is faster than the RTX 2080 Ti, although we suspect actual performance may not be quite that good when we get to reviewing it in the next few weeks. Nevertheless, that would be impressive performance at the price. However, don't expect to be getting RTX 2080 Ti performance in a laptop anytime soon, as Nvidia's laptop GPUs do feature hard power limits that usually restrict performance relative to the same GPU in desktops. I'd expect the laptop chip to be 20% slower or thereabouts based on our previous testing of laptop versus desktop GPUs. As for launch timeframe, we're not expecting new gaming laptops until 2021, given that's when we should be seeing new H-series processors from Intel, and laptop OEMs typically like to refresh both the CPU and GPU at the same time. With RDNA 2 on laptops also a possibility, as well as Zen 3 APUs, I think 2021 will be a pretty exciting time for gaming laptops. We might get some serious improvements in that area. This week, we've seen some of the first Tiger Lake products hit the market, along with plenty more announcements of various laptops. But rather than covering a bunch of refreshed Dell XPS designs and so on, I thought it would be more interesting to focus on Gigabyte's mini PC because it's interesting to see a Tiger Lake powered mini PC announced so soon. The Brix Pro features Tiger Lake U-series processors from the Core i3 1115G4 up to the Core i7 1165G7. Interestingly, despite this being more of a desktop form factor, the 1185G7 flagship isn't seen here. In any case, it looks like these mini PCs are configured with the maximum 28 watt power mode that Intel supports with Tiger Lake. So we're getting the highest 2.8 GHz base clock and of course 4.7 GHz turbos with that 4 core 8 thread part. Inside the PC we're getting a typical array of connectivity, this is a bare bones unit so you'll have to add stuff like memory with dual DDR4 3200 sodium slots and SSDs yourself. Given Tiger Lake supports PCIe 4.0, there is an M.2 slot with direct PCIe 4.0 to the CPU and the other with PCIe 3.0 or SATA. 2.5 gig LAN and Thunderbolt 4 also seen here. The Brix Pro will be available on November 20 and given the GPU power of Tiger Lake, it could be a rather neat little PC for certain applications that require something low profile, small form factor and relatively low power. A new version of Ace's popular Predator X34 monitor has been spotted by TFT Central. The new variant is called the X34S and it appears to bring a new LG Nano IPS panel to the table. The Predator X34 has been Ace's flagship IPS ultrawide gaming monitor for some time, receiving updates such as the X34P along the way, but the X34S looks set to provide the biggest improvement yet. Aside from getting a new nano IPS panel, presumably with some of the fast response times we've seen, it also brings support for 200Hz refresh rates via overclocking. That's actually quite a bit faster than any LG implementation we've seen yet. For example, the 34GN850 only goes up to 160Hz. Apparently there's also a native G-Sync module and display HDR400 certification. It's expected the monitor will be available in December of this year, but outside of that we don't have any pricing information. Microsoft has finally announced this week that they'll be bringing x64 emulation to Windows on ARM shortly, starting with a preview through the Windows Insider program in November. Back when I last tested ARM support with Windows, and this was quite a while ago now, one of the major sticking points was how it handled emulation. Of course, it's always better to run native applications 
applications on a processor, so those compiled for ARM are the best choice, but in the transition period where ARM adoption is just starting out, it's important to have a decent set of emulation tools to run key applications that haven't yet or maybe never will, get native ARM versions. When Windows on ARM was initially released, this emulation only supported x86 or 32-bit apps. x64 support will expand that to 64-bit apps, which do now form a large section of apps that you'll find for Windows. There's still question marks over whether ARM processors will stack up to x86 from a performance perspective, but at the very least it's interesting as an area to look at for mobile computing. Maybe when x64 emulation is released and we get new devices with Qualcomm's Snapdragon 8CX Gen 2, that'll be a good time to revisit the situation. Anyway, that's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe for our news coverage. We do a fair bit of it these days, and we will be back next week to talk about Zen 3. So again, great time to subscribe. Um, what else? We have our Patreon page as well, if you're interested in signing up and supporting the channel. We have our Discord chat, monthly live streams, behind-the-scenes videos, all that sort of thing available over there. That's it for this one. I'll catch you in the next one. <laughs>